or you better come to my defense. <coughs> so I always like to start off uh, talks with this slide. Because the first thing people think when you tell algae, they think, you know, green slime is inside the road, it gets on their tires, and you're walking through the mud. Um, but that's just not always the case. Guam is really, a, has a wonderful diversity of marine plants around here. I think the last video that I saw was put it somewhere around almost 500 different species. And yes, some of them are green, but vast majority of them are not. And they come in a whole different slew of uh, morphologies and, well, ecological niches. So let's talk a little bit about why do we care about algae? What does it do for Guam? And why are we talking about it at Coral Reef Symposium? First of all, the small green algae, like little hair algae, and all this turf that you find over a lot of the reefs, is the basis for the food chain around here in many ways. Um, many of the herbivores you see swimming around Guam uh, do feed on this, and it's an important part of their diet. It's also really important, and not just on Guam, for creating habitat. I'm sure everybody has seen pictures of the great coral, uh, coral, ha, huh, the great kelp forests in California. And all of those giant kelp are actually algae. And here on Guam, they provide a similar, um, many kinds of them provide a similar uh, ecological role in that they just create habitat complexity, which basically means they create places for small animals to hide and live, which is necessary if you're trying to avoid predators. And this is a picture of sargass, and I think this is from the Caribbean, but we do have some similar species of this out here. And another one that is really surprising to a lot of people is that, well, as Dr. Berkeley mentioned, we have uh, corals, and corals are often, um, very, you know, maybe the most important reef accretor that we have. But there are many different kinds of stony algae that are often mistaken for corals that provide the same. Um, that was provide that same role. So, which means laser. So you can see here we have a whole bunch of corals, corals, corals. But this little clump right here, that's algae. That's algae. And all of this other purple stuff that's encrusting over everything is really necessary to not only grow the reefs, but to cement all the small pieces that break off together. So this is another great picture. Um, all of this is algae. There's, except for little orange here. All of this is the kind of algae that really helps. It's called crustose coralline algae, CCA. And then another one, another reason that's really important, especially in light of the topics Dr. Burton was just mentioning, is that there are kinds of algae that are suspected to actually help corals recover from bleaching events. And so this is a picture of Corytus roots. This is the kind of coral that you see in Apple Harbor a lot of times, also called the cake coral. And if you break off pieces of this, I'm not, I'm not saying everyone should do this, but take my word for it. <laughs> if, you take, if you look at some of the, the broken off pieces, you can see on the bottom here you have the coral tissue. It's what you generally see when you're swimming around the water. Um, you have sponge, which is a bioroder, so it's actually growing into the limestone of the coral. But this bright purple band is actually a kind of unicellular algae. And there was a paper that came out, I think, about a year ago, something like that, talking about how when a coral bleaches, or rather when it loses its zooxanthellae, there's reason to believe that this, this uh, algae that lives inside the coral skeleton can provide it some of the nutrients and the necessities it needs when the normal photosynthesis is not in action. So this could potentially be a very important thing when it comes to reef resilience. But of course, this is more a typical picture, I think, of what people think of when we're talking about algae. And this is a picture from Hawaii, where many of their reefs are overgrown with uh, several invasive species. And one of the big questions that we need to know is that, well, why is it that sometimes these species go crazy on reefs? Like, it doesn't lie. But for instance, on Guam, it doesn't. Is that an environmental factor? Is there something in the genetics? We don't know. And so the base research you really have to do is making sure you totally understand what species and what diversity you have on your race. And this is really kind of the basis of my project. So how do we define a species? This seems like it might be an arbitrary thing, but it's not. Um, 
You know, if you're looking at a cow versus a butterfly, it's pretty clear to know that they're not the same species. But when we're looking at organisms that have a lot of what we call morphological plasticity, that is, they have a lot of different ways that they can actually look, it's not that easy. So, for instance, right here in this little petri dish, this is actually the same, um, this is the same algae. But algae have very complex life histories. They have very com complicated, complicated reproduction, uh, re reproductive cycles. And for instance, in this case, you would never have guessed that this was the same as this one unless you looked at the genetics of it. So I kind of touched on it briefly, but the morphological species concept says um, that we define species based on what they look like, period, end of story. Um, and I'll talk about it in a little bit that's not actually the most efficient way to define a species. Biological species concept is a little more, makes a little more sense in terms of evolution. Um, it basically says that if two organisms can, can breed or can mix their gametes and produce viable offspring, then that means that they're a species. Um, but that, and then of course that goes and confuses things with hybrids, which is especially an issue with corals. It's very difficult to tell species apart because of this. And then ecological species concept, if the species have the same niche, they have, if they provide the same role, in the environment, then they can sometimes be considered um, a different species. And then the one that I really want to talk about is the phylogenetic species concept. So phylogenetics is really the study of, well, it's using genes, it's using the DNA of an organism and, and looking at that to determine how closely related it is to another specimen or of, of the same species, of the same genus or whatever. And when you look at all of these all together, which is generally what you want to do when we're defining species, you call it the unified species concept. Um, I talked a little bit, I think, about all of the you know, the pros and cons of each of those concepts, but when you're kind of the new age of taxonomy, the new age of defining diversity, you need to look at all of these different things together because taxonomy and defining species is not as simple as we used to think it was. So why do we want to use DNA? What's so cool about genetics? Well, first off, it's pretty quick. You just take a piece of whatever it is that you need to get and extract the DNA and sequence it. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, but you don't want to use the entire genome. That's just that's way too expensive for most people's reasons. Um, so you actually use what we call a marker, a very specific portion of the genome, um, and compare that across whatever taxon you're interested in. And like I said, it can help ID difficult specimens or one that, that are technically the same but very look, look very differently um, just by looking at the genetics of it. And then when you're using DNA, it allows you to identify what we call cryptic species. And cryptic species are those, like I mentioned before, that may look identical to each other, but they're actually, um, they're actually genetically distinct. Uh, let's see, I've got five minutes. <laughs> so what my project involves, involves this little plant right here, it's called Actinotrichia, you find it all over the coast of Guam, um, especially over in Idaho, if you go surfing over by a pocket point, there's a ton of it there. And so what my study has basically looked at is to see, all right, it's not feasible for one person to spend the money and the time to examine the cryptic diversity, the genetic diversity of all marine plants out there. So let's just pick one and go from there and see what we find. And so that's what we've done with this one. And it's an ideal one to study for this. It's easy to recognize on the reefs. Um, it's found out all throughout the world's oceans, except the Caribbean, on the enough. And uh, some recent publications that came out said that there, they suspect there would be a, a species complex within that group. Um, meaning they expect there would be a lot more species in there. They just need someone to look at it. So distinguishing pictures, like I said, it's kind of orange, it's kind of crunchy, it's branching. Um, it's very distinct. If you guys are desperately interested in finding it, come look, come talk to me afterwards, and I can tell you where to go. Um, let me see. Yeah. So very, very, pretty easy to find. And generally around the world, there are four species recognized that we know of, or that are described right now. Um, the original one was over in Mokong, Yemen, actually. Um, called Actinotrichia fragilis. And only in the last couple of years have we really seen anyone looking at the genetic diversity of it otherwise. So even though it was, um, it was described from over here, everyone is calling this the same species 